Hello everybody, welcome. This is one of my favorite videos I get to do because once a month I get to do a deeper dive on 20 different items that I think are interesting or fun or have a great past and we get to talk more about them. I appreciate the support of my level two and three members. They do get to see this first as a bonus video and they get early access because all these items you see are being listed on eBay to sell and we're gonna see how they do at auction. I think this is a good month. We're right at the end of October going into November for eBay to start picking up. We have a lot of people starting to look for holidays already, and a lot of collectors are indoors and pondering their collections and wanting to expand them. So let's take a look at what we have this month. There's some really fun things. Starting with this guy here, I'm gonna hold a white card up behind him so you can see this beautiful green color. This lovely frog with this great streamlined design is by Baccarat, and you can see their label on the top of the piece, but they don't always have paper labels. What you really want to look for is this very, very long lasting etched mark of theirs. This has been in use over a century now. There we go, you can see it there, Baccarat, France. Baccarat is a small town in the northeast of France where a lot of the glass and ceramic making is. And they do wonderful crystal. They were actually established by King Louis XV. He was the one who liked apartment dwelling and wasn't crazy about Versailles, but he wanted nice, tasteful things for his apartment dwelling. And he thought that France needed a good crystal maker. And they were located in areas with a lot of firewood so they could fire the kilns. So originally all this was made by wood firing. By the 1820s, they were one of the first French houses to be making elaborate chandeliers, and by 1839, they were starting to do color, and what rich and beautiful color this guy has. Now, this is a more recent label, 1970s, 80s, but they are not making the frog anymore. The figurines that they are making are typically selling for $250 or more starting price because Baccarat is considered very, very, very good glass. There are two people who are Knights of the Order of Arts and Letters in France who work for Baccarat. That is a really big distinction in France. And they are still considered one of the premier glass makers. If you are wanting to shop at a Baccarat store, some of them are open to the public and some of them are by invitation only. Even the leak, you can just walk right in the door in Rodeo Drive. So Baccarat is definitely trying to be exclusive. I think he's just such a great color. I've seen these and had these before in other colors, but I really like it in the green. It reminds me of our little tree frogs that have just gone into hibernate for the season here in Kentucky. And I think he's just great. So we're going to start him off at only $49. We do have a buy it now of just under 100 so I think he's well-priced for what he is, and we'll see who wants to have him spring into their life. Part of my fascination with World Spares is that Seattle has had two of them, and one of them was at what now is the campus of my alma mater, the University of Washington, and that was the 1909 Alaska-Yukon Pacific Fair. And this is the most ornate of several different styles of watch fobs you could buy at the fair. Metal arts were really big in the early 1900s. They'd really just gotten the foundry methods where they could do really elaborate, elegant sculpting on metals and coins. And so things were becoming more and more beautiful and more and more elaborate at this time. And this one was definitely pretty deluxe because it has a bunch of cartouches, including William Seward. Alaska, of course, was his folly. He spent $6.7 million on frozen tundra, and that seemed ridiculous to everybody until it turned out it was chock full of gold and oil and timber and all sorts of things that the rest of the country could use. Then he looked like a genius. Next here is the forestry building. This was a great building. It was a temporary building, so it's long gone, but it was made in a traditional style, but all of those columns were actually raw lumber, big logs that they use. So it looked like big trees that made up that building. At the bottom is the manufacturer's building. And then we flip it over and on the back side, and this is part of why this is one of the more collectible of the 1909 World's Fair fobs, you have three more scenes. At the top we have the three graces. That was to represent the Orient, as they called Asia then, Alaska and the Yukon, and then Seattle and the Northwest, because it's the uniting of those three places in trade and manufacturing and connections. Below that, we have the Fine Arts Palace, 
and below that the United States Pavilion. None of these buildings are there anymore, so these representations and old postcards and photos are the only visual evidence we have left of them. And that's part of why these are pretty collectible, too. This particular piece usually sells for as much as $100. We are going to start it out at $9.99. We do have a buy it now if someone is really into this like I am. I have to admit, I collect Seattle 62 World's Fair. I have a few 09 World's Fair pieces. I was tempted to keep this, but I don't wear my pocket watch. So I think it should go to somebody who will use it more than I would. But it is beautiful. Next up, we have a simple little mailer that really caught me by surprise because it is something that was sent out in the 50s to little kids. And it's just a little button with Rin Tin Tin saying, here's your official Rin Tin Tin button. From the Nabisco Shredded Wheats Name That Puppy Contest. Well, Rusty and Rinny, Rin Tin Tin, had puppies on their show, which ran in the on TV from 1954 to about 1958. And if you sent in an idea of what to name the puppy, you would be sent back this lovely little envelope with this card and this pin in it. And of course, what happened is most kids ripped open the envelope, threw the card away, lost the pin, scraped it to death. You wouldn't think that these would be worth anything, but finding all three pieces together is very hard now because these went to children. And surprisingly, the last one that I saw sell online went for over $140. I'm not expecting as much for this one because I'm the second one to sell this package of late, but I was very surprised to see how valuable this was. I wasn't surprised to understand the popularity of Rin Tin Tin, though. Rin Tin Tin was found in a battlefield by an American GI in 1918, and he brought him back to Los Angeles, trained him, and Rin Tin Tin was so talented and so well-trained that he ended up starring in 30 silent movie features and then went on to be a radio show, Rin Tin Tin, the original, died in 1932. We now have Rin Tin Tin the 12th as his legacy. So Rin Tin Tin has certainly continued on down the line. And Rin Tin Tin also was so popular that he made German Shepherds a popular breed to have as family pets. Before that, they were considered to be too large and and potentially too vicious to have in a house. But Rin Tin Tin changed everybody's attitude. So he was a star amongst dogs. He also starred alongside Robert Blake in 1947, the return of Rin Tin Tin in that year. And that's what got Rin Tin Tin back into the public light and why there was able to be this TV show in the 1950s. So Rin Tin Tin's got a long and illustrious history and even has four paws on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. One other fun little connection to Rin Tin Tin was Bob Barker of The Price is Right actually voiced Rin Tin Tin in the 1940s in the radio serials. Woof. This next piece is so cleanly designed, so simply designed, and so thoughtfully designed because it was by Jens Quisgard, who was the designer for dance from 1954 until the 1980s. A couple named the Nirnbergers came over to Europe in the early 50s looking for interesting design that they could take back and import to America. And they went to the Danish Museum of Art and saw Quiskard's brand new installation of Fjord. And Fjord was a line of flatware. It was the first flatware to mix tea candles with stainless steel. And it was very modern. It looked great. And this American couple were so taken by it that they insisted on meeting the artist. They made an arrangement with him, and he ended up designing most of Dansk's really important mid-century modern lines. He did over 4,000 different pieces for them in his 35-year career. This one does have the Denmark mark on the bottom. People who collect Dansk really do prefer the Danish-made and the French-made pieces to the pieces made offshore later. This is a nice turned variety. There were several different varieties of these pepper mills that he did. And it's a very clever design because you can put the peppercorns in the middle here and you turn to grind and they come out the bottom and then you put the salt in the bottom and it shakes out the top. So you have a two in one set here. So you only needed one thing on the table. I just think his designs are really great. 
this particular piece, uh, they can sell anywhere from about $50 to $100. I'm starting this one at $39. We're lucky to have had Quiskard because he was a member of the Danish resistance in the Second World War and narrowly avoided being killed. Next up is an autograph that is of a pretty famous person who almost really was somebody. Well, he was somebody anyway. But Thomas Dewey almost was the president of the United States, not once but twice. He ran against FDR in 1944. He was the New York governor, and New York was actually very well run under his tutelage. He managed to cut the state deficit by $100 million and use the money to increase teacher salaries, mental health beds in wards, all sorts of things that would be considered progressive end of the spectrum now, but at the time he was considered a moderate Republican. And he ran unsuccessfully against FDR and then ran again in 1948. This is from 1947 to Mrs. Marion Schultz with warm regard, Thomas D. Dewey. This would have been during the beginning of his second presidential campaign, the original photo. You can see it was uh, done on a plate. It's a rather large photo, which is unusual. He didn't sign a lot of photos, actually, from what I've seen. And there's the 1944 Grey Tone Studio mark on there. Thomas Dewey learned a valuable lesson that I think a lot of us who do YouTube and stuff like that are also learning, and that is it is so important to be yourself. He was way ahead in the polls in 1948. He was supposed to beat Truman by a landslide, but he was so afraid of offending anybody or saying the wrong thing that he didn't put out any real policy positions, he didn't say what he was going to do, and he barely ever spoke of the parties or gave people any reason to feel that there was a reason to choose him over his competitor because he didn't want to make anybody mad. So instead of coming out and saying what he really felt, he just sort of presented a very bland, glossed, image, and that did not play well in rural America or Western America, and as a result, Truman came from behind and beat him. That's why he was never president, and that's why he didn't sign a whole lot more photos, and that's probably why his photos sell for a surprisingly large amount, considering that his highest office was governor of New York. Uh, Dewey is actually still pretty well known today. So we're going to start this again at $9.99. We're just going to see where it goes. But signed pictures by him, especially photographs, seem to typically be selling in a $40 to $60 range. So I'll be curious to see how this does. This next piece is a very modern looking item considering its age. This is Glidden. Glidden Parker went to Alfred School in New York and studied ceramics. And with one of the professors, he started his own pottery company, and he did some things that were pretty innovative. First of all, he was working in stoneware in the late 40s and early 50s when that was not a medium a lot of people used. Secondly, he used some new technology, uh, some various presses, and a way of slip casting where he was able to do these interesting glazes. So you notice that some of it is glazed and some of it is not. It's glazed inside to be able to hold water but it's only glazed on two sides on the outside because that gave it its detail. And by being able to do this one-step process, they could produce a lot of wear in a short period of time that actually had hand work and hand embellishment on it. So Glidden took off. Glidden was so popular, by 1951, it was being seen on the set of I Love Lucy. If you look at their original New York apartment, there's one episode where she actually butts her cigarette out in a Glidden egg dish, of all things. And so it was prominently featured, and it was popular with a lot of uh, very high-end department stores. Bloomingdale's, Bergdorf Goodman, uh, Marshall Fields, those were the type of stores that sold Glidden pottery. The great thing about it is it was really high-fired stoneware, so it tends to be impervious to where you don't see scratches on it. Even the dinnerware held up really well. He was just considered a real innovator in his time. Uh, the pottery did really well through the 1950s, and at that point he ended up retiring. They would not sell their factory seconds, and so they stored them all in a shed. And finally, there were enough that by 1949, they made a deal with the brothers Sikon, who came along and bought it and started the Pottery Barn based on selling Glidden Seconds, because Glidden did not want to send seconds to his department store accounts. So a couple of 
big name companies came out of this. I think it's a neat piece. We don't see a ton of Glidden these days, even though a lot was made in a short period of time, just because it's been so long, and a lot of this is in collection. So I was happy to find this piece. It's got a nice mark on the bottom. I will be starting this one again at $9.99, but I expect that it will probably sell for around the buy it now I have on it of $75. This next gal is my only Fenton offering this month, but she is a good one. This is the lovely damsel with the spring hat in the Fenton Burmese. And Burmese is made, of course, using uranium and also using a little touch of gold to get that pink color. So it was an expensive thing for them to make. And here's what she looks like under a black light. Ah, there, now you're getting it in full glowy glory. So she is really pretty, and you notice that the frit, the glass frit that they applied at the bottom on the flowers, glows purple under a black light, which is really cool. So you get some real dimension if you are a black light collector and you like decorated items. This is a good one because of how the frit shines. Even though Fenton is an old glass company, the Burmese pieces that they did did not come about until 1970. There was a big period of time between the Second World War and the late 50s that industrial production was not allowed to use uranium because it all had to be saved for war and Defense Department purposes. Eventually, they lightened up on that, but it wasn't until 1970 that Fenton introduced its Burmese, and it did it based on formulas from the original Burmese done by Frederick Shirley, the designer who came up with Burmese, working at Mount Washington Glass back in 1885. Again, using uranium and a trace of gold to get the pink. It's generally done in a satin finish because Mount Washington found back then that it sold better in satin finish. So all the other companies seem to have followed that. You don't see gloss finishes much at all on Burmese by anybody. She's a beauty. And she's got great marks on her. This is later production for Fenton. It says it's designed by Spindler. It's number 1152 of only 2,000 in this edition. And then you have your hand painter, S. Miller, here. So it's got lots of good marks. It's a really good piece as Fenton pieces go. And she's just lovely. We are going to see how she does. These typically sell nowadays for as much as a few hundred dollars. Uh, because of the glass frit, it really seems like that is a very popular thing. And when I say glass frit, what it is is that these little flowers here that glowed purple are actually white under a regular light. But this is all glass that's applied. That's glass frit. And then the gold is little enamel paint. So there's a lot that went into making this piece. You might have noticed that I'm a car guy. And I found something at the Springfield Antique Show in a friend of mine's booth that I just thought was interesting enough to share and to put online. And it is this. This is the 1934 Gram folder about cars. This is the sales folder that is telling you to bring yourself up to date on your knowledge of motor car performance. And the reason they're talking about that is because Grams really set the trend in the early part of the Depression. And at first their sales held up pretty well because of it, because in 1932 they came out with this design. And this design, which looks old-fashioned to us now, is actually very far forward for its time. The fenders were integrated so that you didn't get a bunch of gunk collecting under the car like the old days. The hood was tapered and there wasn't a radiator cap sticking above it anymore. It's much more streamlined. The hood is integrated into the car more. These are the designs of a fellow named Amos Northrup who did their redesign for them. Then the other thing they did, they had a supercharger attached to the engines that they were getting from the Continental Company. And the supercharger was a huge deal. A supercharger puts another belt on the engine so it can go really, really fast. So all of a sudden, this company that started building trucks for Dodge in the late 20s ended up building some of the fastest and most luxurious looking middle price cars in the country during the Depression. By the Second World War, they were folded into what eventually became the Kaiser Fraser Company. And after the Second World War, Kaiser Fraser came out with a bunch of innovations and new looks in cars that no one had ever seen before either. So the Graham brothers contributing a lot of wonderful things to the automotive world. They typically sell for about $20 to $25. 
I've always liked the quality of good quality restaurant wear. I just sold two sets of Syracuse fine china, which were made for home use at my storehouse sale this last weekend. But this is Syracuse china. Notice the back stamp below. This is for Great Northern Railway. Also notice that it's very thick. This is not part of their fine china line. This is part of their restaurant wear line. They made a lot of restaurant wear for a lot of years, and a lot of it went to the railroads. Great Northern had this design, Mountains and Flowers, done in ashtray form. This is an early 60s piece, but the Mountain and Flowers pattern has been around for a while. It pays to memorize some of these patterns if you like cafe wear. Memorize the railroad and steamship patterns that are not obvious, that don't have a flag or a logo on them, because a lot of these slip through in thrift stores and estate sales if they don't have the railroad back stamp. Now, sometimes they're only collectible with the railroad back stamp, so do study your patterns, but a lot of them were not always back stamped and are collectible whether they have the railroad name on them or not. So it pays to know these patterns. This little ashtray, which probably cost all of a dime when it was purchased new wholesale, should sell for somewhere in the $40 range today because ashtrays are popular and railroad china is still popular. It's surprisingly popular still. I think it's one of those things that you can use and it's cool and it's got a connection to the past. And a lot of people had railroad workers in their families. So there are a lot of people who still have connection to this. And you're most likely to pick these up anywhere along the original route of the Great Northern Railway, which ran from St. Paul, Minnesota to Seattle. It was one of the major transcontinental railroads. It is now the Northern in Burlington, Northern Santa Fe. This next piece is something that older kids had when I was a kid that I always coveted and never could own. And, well, I'm probably not going to get to keep this one either because they're kind of expensive and it needs to go to its ultimate collector. But it is fun to have one for a moment. And that is this. The Cox Thimbledrome Prop Rod. This appears to be a 1950s version Cox started out right at the end of World War II in 1945 building wooden pull toys for little toddlers because you couldn't get metal and that was something that he could get as a material and he could make toys out of it. So he got started that way. Well, then in 1946, metal was available, so he converted to metal push toys and some of them were cars and some of them were perfect to use as tether cars. Tether cars were before there was remote control. You could have a car with an engine, but it would just drive off by itself to nowhere if you didn't have it on a tether, so it would go in a circle and you could keep track of it. So that was a tether car. The Cameron brothers were the ones who developed the Thimble Drome engine, and we can take that out and you can see what that looks like. This thing has hardly ever been used, maybe never. On the bottom, you have the prop rod Thimble Drome. And, of course, they didn't put a driver under the little bubble because the point of this is that you are the driver. There is the thimble drome, and there is the little gas motor underneath. And these gas motors really worked well, and so by the 50s, Cox had really perfected them. They came out with the TD motors, a bunch of other variations, and they became very powerful, and pretty soon Cox was making airplanes and they were making remote control vehicles and boats and all sorts of cool things. This one is fun because it's got the sticker on the side that it's the Friskies Flyer. So a little bit of advertising for Friskies dog food back in the 50s there. It definitely looks like race cars looked at that time. It's just in great shape. The box is pretty clean too. It's not absolutely perfect but it's got most of it slapped. There's one little hole there, uh, but it is intact. And the boxes are a big deal because they really help with the display. Most people are just displaying these now, although you could use them if you wanted to. And it's even got the original envelope with all the wires and things that were necessary to put it all together. So this one says it is powered with the Space Bug Junior engine. It's just really neat, completely assembled, ready to run. I'm ready to take it out and play with it right now. These are pretty valuable, especially in this condition. We're going to start this at $99. So back into its little garage it goes until it goes off to live with somebody else. But it's so much fun. Sometimes I just like having these things just for a moment so that I can relive that childhood dream.
Our second autograph here is a very famous singer who is still alive and with us, although she is not performing as a singer anymore in her mid-80s, and that is Joan Baez. And this has a lovely signature here, and you can tell it's real because she started with a black pen, the black pen ran out, and she had to pick up a blue pen and continue writing, which I think is just really fun because it lets you know that it's genuine. Nobody's going to fake a signature in that manner. And I know it's genuine, too, because I know the person who got this when they went to see her back in the 1980s, and she had already been singing for over 35 years at that point. She got started when she went to a Pete Seeger concert when she was 13 years old, and she was so taken with the folk music that she went home, got his music, started practicing all of it and singing it all, and it turned out that she had a lovely voice, which by her own admission, she says, came out of nowhere. Of course, she's very identified with folk music and the counterculture. She brought Bob Dylan to the Newport Folk Festival three years after she was first introduced there, and after 60 years of performing, she definitely is a musical legend at this point. Most of her songs are interpretations of other people's work, Diamonds and Rust is probably her most familiar song that is all hers, and it was covered of all plans by Judas Priest in about 1980. So she has been really influential for a few generations on a lot of other singers as well, and it's just really interesting to find something signed by her. I haven't run into anything by her before, so we're going to start this at $9.99 and just see where it goes. This next piece, I think, is really cool because it's an early beer promotion, and it is pre-prohibition. And anytime you get into pre-prohibition beer promotions, the values really tend to run up. This is for Schlitz beer. This is what they call a pocket Vesta. It's essentially a match holder. And you can tell this one was used. There's the striker on the top, and it definitely has evidence of use. It's got a nice leather wrap on it that's in good condition. You open the top up, and this is where you would have stored your matches. And then on the bottom, this one's kind of deluxe. It has a little cigarillo cutter. So you could actually pull this back. You open it up this way, you put your little cigarette that you rolled in there, and you cut the end off, and then you can light your cigarette. It's got the Schlitz globe on the back. At the time this was made, around 1900, Schlitz produced one million barrels of beer for the first time and overtook Pabst and for a long time was the largest beer brand in the entire United States and probably in the world. They even built tied houses and what that was was, you see some of the buildings are still there in Chicago with the Schlitz logo on them. They would actually build taverns where you could only get Schlitz beer. Nowadays, that probably wouldn't be allowed, but back then they could get away with it. It was a great way to establish the prominence of their brand and get people to be very brand loyal to Schlitz. And this was another attempt at that to give lots of things that would remind people about the product. There it says on the side, it's from Milwaukee, and that's where the beer came from then, so it must have been good. Actually, beer was brewed all over, but Milwaukee became the brewery capital of the United States in part because of Schlitz. Schlitz was pretty innovative. They were the first in 1912 to use brown bottles so that the beer wouldn't spoil in the bottle by being exposed to sunlight, and pretty much everybody copied them after that. So they deserve a lot of credit and were prominent until they were purchased by Strohs. I've only seen a few of these for sale. This one is in better condition, and like I like to say, if you have the best one, you can get more for it. So I'm going to put this out again at $9.99 and just let it fly. I am letting a lot of things start low and just see where they go this month. Uh, this one I don't think I have a buy it now on because I don't really know in this condition what it should sell for. I haven't seen one as clean as this for a while. I have just one piece of jewelry this month, and it is this very attractive... Sterling and Malachite bracelet, and it is signed. It is Zuni, actually, rather than Navajo, technically, because it's signed, as you can see on the back of these different pieces, by James B. Eustis. And James Eustis didn't really start producing jewelry until about 1990. He is still in business, but this particular stone was very popular right when he got started. So this is an early piece of his. I really like the work. It definitely has the hand chasing 
he got a lot of his inspiration from being taught traditional native crafts because he grew up on the Cochiti Pueblo in New Mexico. And now this stuff is displayed as far as the British Museum in London. So he has definitely gotten a reputation. I think the work is really good. This is an earlier piece of his. Again, we're starting this at just $9.99, but we do have a buy it now on it. And they even have the original business card they got with it from Cochiti Pueblo with a very early 90s looking graphic. So that gives us a little idea of its place in time. It actually fits my wrists and I have average size wrists, so I think that's a good sign. And if you ever want to meet him, he is still working and he does a big show with other artists at the Palace of the Governors in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is a big important place in Southwest American history worth seeing. Well, sculpting and handwork do seem to be some of the themes for this month's listings. And so I wanted to share this coin with you. This is something I don't usually sell online. But this one's unusual and hard enough to find that I thought it was worth showing. And it's got some good history as well. This is a Canadian silver dollar from 1945. They did not produce a lot of silver dollars during the Second World War. And in 1945, they only produced under 40,000 of these, which is a pretty small issue. This is in what I would say is probably very fine to extra fine condition. It's not uncirculated. It has been touched by human hands, but the designs are really great. On one side, we have the voyageurs. Now, les voyageurs, which shows a fur trapper and a First Nations person paddling in a canoe. This is a throwback to really early in Canadian history. This was done, this side, by Emmanuel Hahn, who was the founder of the Sculptors Society of Canada. And he designed this for George V as a commemorative piece in 1935 for his Silver Jubilee, the 25th anniversary. Well, then George V died the next year, and so they had to redo the front, and they decided to put it in circulation as a silver dollar, and the front had to have the new king, George VI. And George VI was sculpted by Humphrey Paget. And Humphrey Paget had originally done this for Edward VII, but of course Edward VII ended up abdicating and not taking the throne, so they were not put into production. Paget also designed coins for Bolivia and New Zealand, and he came by it honestly because his dad was the illustrator of the Robinson Crusoe Treasure Island books. You can see a couple of lines by his neck there. They look like scratches. These are what I refer to as bag marks, and that's where they throw a lot of these, and you'll see them even on uncirculated coins. They throw coins in a bag together, and you will end up with little nicks and scratches and stretch marks and things from them just rattling around together. So uh, in interest of full disclosure, I want to show that. Uh, but this is a hard one to find. If I didn't already have this in my collection, I would be keeping it but I had the good fortune to get one several years ago at an estate, so this one is meant to go to somebody else. The designs are really, really very nice, and I thought was what was particularly interesting is this was one of the first depictions of the monarch with no crown and no regalia, just a very simple representation of George VI. It still has some of its mint luster and shine, and because of that, this piece could go for as much as $150 to $200 because it is considered a fairly key date, meaning a hard one to find, because they just didn't make a lot of them. And while we're on early world's fairs, another one I really always have enjoyed the pieces from is the 1915 San Francisco World's Fair, which took place by the Presidio in what is now the Marina District. There's only one building left from it, and that is the Palace of Fine Arts. But this was given out at the Idaho Pavilion, which was made of burlap and plaster and intended to be torn down and only lasted a year. But it was a great year. It was a two-story building. It looked quite fine from the outside. And this is the enamel button that you got if you were somebody working in the Idaho Pavilion. It's got the mark of the makers in the back with the copyright mark and a nice pin back. I think the colors are really good. The Idaho Pavilion featured a live demonstration and miniature of Shoshone Falls. They actually built a likeness of it that was about 10 or 15 feet tall in the middle of the pavilion. And it also, of course, had a giant potato because, well, Idaho is 
known for its famous potatoes. And that's part of how they got famous. That's why states took pavilions at the World's Fair. The 1915 Panama Pacific Exposition offered space for pavilions to all 48 states. Only about 26 had the money to take them up on it. A lot of the states in the East in particular didn't think that their people would go that far to see the World's Fair. But the states who were there really benefited from it because the whole point of the 1915 World's Fair was to say, yes, San Francisco has come back from the fire and earthquake, but also that now that the canal's open, the West Coast is open to the country and the rest of the world, and it's much easier to get things here, so come on out and see us. And it worked. A lot of people moved to the West because of the World's Fairs in Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego in the early part of the 20th century. Almost all of the 1915 World's Fair is gone now because it was built on filled-in swampland, which is why it shook so hard and was one of the areas with the most damage in the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. And that is the reason that the Palace of Fine Arts was completely seismically retrofit so that it can remain. The 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition was not strictly limited to San Francisco either. It is the only World's Fair that was held, to my knowledge, in two cities because San Diego also got to have a World's Fair at Balboa Park, and a lot of that is still left for people to see. This also came from the 1915 World's Fair, the San Francisco edition. On one side, you have this figure, the winged Mercury, and on the other side, you have these figures representing the joining of the two hemispheres. Look at the beauty and design in these medallions. This was 50 cents at the fair if you got it in gold. It was a quarter in bronze, so those are more common now, and it was a dollar in silver, so you hardly see those at all. This particular one was done by the sculptor Robert Aitken, and it was actually stamped on the grounds. The United States Mint, which had a branch in San Francisco, actually opened a mint at the fair so you could see things being made, and these were some of the things that were made there. I think it's just really very beautiful. The designs were in that end of the Art Nouveau era where sculpture in particular is just really grand, and it's an art form that's really being explored on a big level because the Detail is able to be refined so much more now with the modern processes coming into metal making at this time. And so there is a lot of interest in these. And there still is today amongst collectors. This could sell anywhere from $45 to $75 potentially. Again, we're going to start it at $9.99. I think we do have a buy it now on it. This little piece came to me from a Florida junk store, and I think it's so cute. This is Stangle. I like Stangle. I think Stangle is really underrated right now. Stangle took over the old Fulper plant in Flemington, New Jersey, and started making a whole line of various things like birds, figures, and dinnerware, and all of it was hand-painted. A lot of effort and work went into these pieces. This one is from the 1950s, and notice the stamp. It is called Kitty Wear because this is intended to be a child's tray, even though it looks like a relish dish, and even though most people use them as relish dishes these ways. But it was the idea that little kids don't like their food to touch, so you could have one thing here, one thing here, and one thing there, and it would keep it apart. It had a shallow side, so it would be easy for them to scoop food out. It also was the shape and size of a lot of TV trays. And this was done in the 1950s. TV trays were a new concept in dinnerware because that was the beginning, uh, at least for some families. We were not allowed in my house. We had to sit at the dinner table, but a lot of families started sitting in front of the television at dinner time, And that is when we start seeing a lot of pieces like this made. It's just very cute. You can actually feel the embossing from the paint here. So this is actually raised just a little bit. Very good quality. Stengel did good work. These don't sell for a ton. I think I have a buy it now of 29 on it, but they're just cute as can be. And I think this needs to go live with somebody who appreciates railroads, appreciates child's wear, or just appreciates good quality earthenware. This next little piece is just a little piece, but it has a good history. See the very angry-looking heraldic eagle in flight with the talons out and the shield. Well, that gives you a pretty good idea that this is going to be around one of the wars, and in this case, it is the Second World War. 
and this is from Hamilton Foundry in Ohio. The Hamilton Foundry was actually a second foundry op operated by a company called Sonnen Rentschler, but they had a big flood in 1913 and had to consolidate everything at their second factory. So by the time the war came, the Hamilton Foundry was the plant, and they, as you see, were also a machine company. They had been around since 1891, so it was their 50th anniversary, but the significance of 1941, right at the beginning of the Second World War. They are showing resolve for the war effort. They had made paperweights as a staple in the 1930s when business wasn't very good. By the time this came along, the war was about to consume the United States, and so patriotic motifs were the thing. You don't see a lot of these. They were done for a very short time. And then, of course, companies like Hamilton Foundry had to put all the effort into war material, and they stopped making things like this. So this is actually hard to find. I'm starting it at $9.99. I have a buy it now of $59 because one sold for quite a bit more than that recently. So we'll see if there's a second customer out there who understands it like the first one did. But I certainly understand that it's a good piece, and we will see where it goes. This piece is surprisingly modernist, considering that it was made by Francoma. This is the mocha brown color. This came in various colors because it was made as a special order originally for a Jersey Shore Polynesian style resort. I believe called the Trade Winds, and that's why you have T8 as the stock number, but it is by Francoma. This was one of the last things that John Frank designed for Francoma right around the time in 1970 two that he was named the American Small Businessman of the Year. He was really getting his due, and then unfortunately he passed on. But his company was very, very successful at this time, and they would do special orders for certain restaurants, certain advertising pieces, certain religious gatherings, and this ended up being a line that was so popular that they sold it for a number of years. They're pretty collectible now. And it's an ashtray on top of it, which nowadays ashtrays are also something people are seeking. I have seen this sell for as much as $50 in other colors. I'm starting it at $9.99. My thought is that it's probably going to sell around $30, which is where I put the buy it now. But we'll let the market tell us. I think it's really cool, and it looks great in a tiki display. It's one piece I would mix with my treasure craft very happily. And that brings us to our last piece. Now, I would say this needs no introduction because we did actually run this a couple of months ago unsuccessfully, but I'm bringing it back for a couple of reasons. One, because the story behind this fellow is quite involved, and one being that I want to tell you what happened so that you can learn something that might be useful to you. This is Ronald K. Apangaluk. He is a Yupik and Inuit. He's got connections to both the Bering Sea, where he grew up on St. Lawrence Island, and the southeastern part of Alaska, where he also has family connections. K is short for Kegagukkak, which refers to put on top. And that's a pretty lofty thing. It's like being on the top of a totem pole, for example. But I think this guy is at the top of his game. He is a wonderful sculptor. We put this on eBay once before, and here's the thing that we all can learn together with. eBay recently, unbeknownst to me because I don't generally sell in this category, changed the rules so that you have to, in the title, describe the type of bone. And I understand why they did that. They took down my listing and said I was welcome to relist it as long as I did that. I decided to take it off the market for a couple of months because I've decided that we're going to sell this in a little different manner. This is not going up on auction. This is actually going to be a fixed price with make an offer because his work is very specific to a very specific group of collectors, but it sells for big money. Pieces like this can sell for between three and six hundred dollars. We are looking at four twenty-five or make offer, but we have to specify that it is walrus bone and vertebrae in the listing. And the reason, of course, is that eBay has been having a horrible time with people claiming that things made of elephant ivory are bone, or faux bone is a popular thing for people to say when they're lying about selling elephant ivory. And eBay has to be very careful because they do not want to run afoul of the law. Selling elephant ivory is something like a $2,000 per sale fine if you get caught. 
And eBay is trying to prevent that. So I understand why they took the listing down and said, I need to put the material in the title, which is what we're going to do now. But I have decided that this is a very specific customer. It needs a little more time on the market to find its customer. I took it to shows in the Northwest where I do have customers for this sort of thing, but I didn't get anybody who was willing to step up for it there. So we're going to put it out to the national market, and this time we're going to do it right and see what happens. But a very interesting person. I can't even imagine what it would be like to grow up on an island in the Bering Sea where you sit inside all winter and carve. But that is why we get these wonderful facial expressions and all the detail and this really interesting juxtaposition of materials. You don't see a lot of his work that involves the vertebrae either. So this is a little bit more unusual, even though it's relatively simple compared to some of his carvings that are done of just walrus Tuscan or a little bit larger or single totemic figures. I am looking forward to seeing how that does. I'm looking forward to seeing what the response to all these items are. And I'm so glad that you were able to come on this deeper dive with me. And thank you so much for watching. If you are a level two or three member, these items are dropping as we watch. And you can go right to the links which are in the description and click on them and take a look and see if it's something you're interested in. If you're a member, you get early access and you've got first dibs on these things. If you're not a member, well, we do roll this out to everybody eventually. And so please do hit those links and see. You can find out if an item sold, get an idea what the market is, or perhaps make a bid yourself if the things interest you. So thank you very much. Follow along with this as these sell over the next 10 days. And we will see where the market is for all of this and learn a lot together. Bye for now. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one. Also click thumbs up to like this video and check the description for information about our Patreon, our memberships. We've got a lot of different levels with different perks and bonus videos and early content. Also, please do check out our website, theantiquenomad.com for appraisal help. And we'll see you again for more adventures in the antique and vintage community soon. Bye for now.